The Ethiopian government has put an end to freedom flights. The Falashas are trapped. Nevertheless, many attempt to escape. I knew that if they caught me, they would make me suffer. They had announced a new law. Whoever attempts to escape will be killed. I was not sure what they would do to me. I thought that if they caught me, they would torture and kill me. The 1977 airlift was the only official emigration negotiated to bring Falashas from Ethiopia to Israel. These are the black Jews of Ethiopia. 3,000 have made it to Israel by diverse and dangerous routes. Each has a story of persecution and flight. Many have endured torture and the loss of family and friends. At the Western Wall in Jerusalem, they celebrate the return from Babylon. This ancient ceremony, lost to the rest of the Jewish world, is called Seget. This unique community and its supporters charge that Israel and the world Jewish community watch in silence while Falashas die. Israel denies this. Many call the denials a cover-up. I think the leadership of world Jewry is involved in this cover-up. Either they are not being told or they are told and do not want to indicate that they know. And if we remember in the Holocaust, the excuse was that we did not know, how could we do anything? Well, now they do know. We send return receipt letters with all kinds of documents. So we know that our leadership knows today. So there's no excuse for them not doing anything. And history will record this. You're telling me that after the Holocaust, there's a quota on bringing these people to Israel? Yes, I think there's no question that there's a quota. There is a quota on bringing them into Israel, and that uh, is a quota that is a policy of the government of Israel and the politicians and they are keeping a secret from the rest of the world Jewish community, and it's a disgrace. Absolutely unequivocally no. The story of my legal occupation is such that I always have to find motivation for such a dastardly charge. I can find none with respect to the American Jewish community, and I can find none with respect to the Israeli government. In my own visit to Ethiopia in 1965, when I went to the village of Ambober, some 30 Kohanim came to that synagogue and gave me a letter addressed to the President of Israel begging to be lifted on the wings of eagles like their co-religionists across the Red Sea in Yemen as quickly as possible, otherwise they faced extinction. And it was signed in Isaiah's phrase, the remnants of Israel. Falasha origins are shrouded in mystery. No one knows how Jews first got to Ethiopia. Some say that Israelites fled to Africa after the destruction of the first temple in 587 BC. Others believe that their ancestors were Egyptian or Yemenite Jews. The most popular legend recounts how in the 10th century BC, the Ethiopian queen Sheba, ruler of the ancient kingdom of Cush, upon hearing of the wisdom of Solomon, traveled to the land of Israel. Legend has it that after seeing the queen's beauty, Solomon tricked the black queen into spending the night with him. The queen returned to Ethiopia, where she gave birth to Solomon's son, Menelik I. When the young prince was old enough, he traveled to Israel and was united with his father. He returned to Ethiopia to firmly establish Judaism in his mother's kingdom. Whatever their origin, Jews have lived in Ethiopia for over two millennia. They practice a literal pre-Talmudic Judaism, strictly observing the laws of Deuteronomy, including circumcision, the Sabbath, holidays, and dietary laws. For over 1,000 years, they ruled most of Ethiopia, preserving their independence longer than the ancient kingdoms of Israel. Their golden age came to an end. In the 17th century, they were defeated by Christians and given a choice, to convert or forever be falasha, exiles. 
the Jews resisted. Many were killed. Others were forcibly converted. All lost their land. For centuries, they lived as tenant farmers, maligned as evil eyes, and restricted to outcast occupations such as metalworking. The isolated Falashas believed they were the last remaining Jews on earth. This archival film was shot by American author Meyer Levin during the reign of Haile Selassie, Lion of Judah, King of Kings, who ruled over feudal Ethiopia for 49 years. Selassie did not change their second-class status. They were, however, free to practice their religion. Each village had its own synagogue. This synagogue is now padlocked. September 1974, Selassie is overthrown. Tanks are stationed outside the palace. The emperor is spirited away in this blue Volkswagen. The revolution precipitated bloody conflicts all over Ethiopia and created over a million refugees. Secessionist movements sprang up everywhere. War erupted between Ethiopia and Somalia over disputed territory. Fighting continues to take place in Eritrea, where Arab-backed guerrillas struggle for independence. The new military junta is called the DERG, or the Committee. From 1977 to 1979, during the campaign of Red Terror, over 15,000 were killed. Jails were crammed with more than 100,000 political prisoners. The new regime was bolstered by 25,000 Cuban troops and over $3 billion in Soviet military aid. Deeply indebted, Ethiopia's new leader, Lieutenant Colonel Mengistu Haile Mariam, propelled Ethiopia into the Soviet bloc. By the fall of 1982, when we surreptitiously shot this film in Ethiopia, the Derg controlled most of the country. Mengistu is seen here reviewing the elite of Africa's largest army with Yugoslavia's president, Peter Stambolic. Under the watchful eye of the ever-present Soviet advisors, Mengistu is attempting to portray a new, less bloody image. Yet violence is the hallmark of his own climb to the top. 1974 the top 60 officials of the old regime, executed. General Aman Andom, a potential rival, executed. 1977, General Kafari Bante, another rival, murdered. Under Mengistu, an uneasy balance now exists between politicians who wish to liberalize Ethiopia and the military, unaccustomed to a free press. Both sides are attempting to change Ethiopia's image from revolutionary battlefield to a stable Marxist state, forging a new national communist identity out of its diverse ethnic communities. Reports tell of a systematic campaign against the Falashas, who refused to trade their ancient faith for the new creed. Chargé d'affaires testified Demeki is the highest ranking Ethiopian diplomat in Washington. Some Zionist organizations have been talking about a group of Ethiopian Jews, Falashas, and that they're being oppressed. Could you comment on that? Is there any truth to this matter? Absolutely, absolutely uh, absurd. Uh, conversely, uh, you see, under the feudal regime, the Falashas were a certain religious group that pursued the Jewish religion uh, in the Gondar area of Ethiopia, uh, who were obviously under the feudal regime, denied uh, the ownership of land. But like any of their compatriots today, Falashas are entitled, like I earlier told you, to 10 hectares of land. Uh, they have the freedom to exercise, uh, develop their religious practices, and are, uh, as well of, as other Ethiopians. 
Symbols such as the Star of David and the Lion of Judah persist, reminders of the deep roots of Judaism in Ethiopian civilization. At the former Haile Selassie University, now called Addis Ababa University, government spokesman Professor Tedessa Tamrat echoes Demaki's position. Well, uh, you know, one of the first things that the, the revolution did was to give religious freedom uh, to everyone, to effectively separate state and church. And um, there is no oppression as far as religion is concerned. So from your point Surprisingly, of view, Leonard Seidemann, director of Hayas, a major American Jewish organization, sides with the Ethiopian government on this issue. The report that I read that I'm giving the most credit to is the one that says that they can freely practice their religion. So you feel that Jews are free to practice their religion in That's Ethiopia right. today? Yes, I think so. Jewish organizations who say that Falashas have religious freedom simply do not know what they're talking about. And I'm not suggesting that they're lying. They have just been ma badly misinformed. We've heard a lot. Uh, we spoke to the Ethiopian... Uh, Barbara Ribico, confused by contradictory uh, reports and determined to find the truth for herself, joined the first group of Western tourists since the revolution to make contact with the Falashas. Is it true? From what we saw, it is very difficult to be a Jew in Ethiopia. The Jews are poor. They have traditionally been discriminated against. Although it is true that the revolutionary government has given them land, they have not been able to keep that land in many places. To practice your religion freely means to have the ability to learn about it. Teaching Jewish studies, learning Hebrew are forbidden in Ethiopia. Under those circumstances, you cannot say that the Jews have religious freedom. One thing must be realized here, that is, Falashas are Ethiopians. They are proud of being Ethiopians. They want to live like Ethiopians. They want to share uh, the hardships, the benefits of uh, their compatriots. They are Ethiopians. They want to remain Ethiopians. They want to die Ethiopians. You go and talk to them. Taking up the challenge, we traveled 10,000 miles to Gondar province, where the last of the Falashas live, to try to discover the truth. The Falashas live here in the Simeon Mountains, near the legendary source of the Blue Nile, Lake Tana's Tissasat Falls. Governor Major Malaku Tefera runs Gondar like a military camp. He has padlocked synagogues, closed Hebrew schools, and imprisoned rabbis. We were warned not to make contact with the Falashas. Unique in all of Africa, Gondar's medieval castles dominate the city. At that site, our appointed guide, Worku Sheru, explains his government's rationale for banning contact between the Falashas and Westerners. It's, and um, see that when people make something out of them and they, they are quaint, they are interesting for tourists and they like to see this. On the other hand, we would like these people to abandon these bad habits. And it's because of that that you're not allowed to go visit uh, and film uh, the village. En route to the Simeon Mountains, the guide became agitated as we attempted to film Falashas out of the Land Rover. You know, guys from the West, you have a fixation. I don't you have know, a fixation. You do. No, really, let's go. Let's risk it. You know, I, I don't have a... But if you lose all this film, then you, you know, you have to be cool. Just yeah. like as you want this, you must be ready to lose your film. This, you must be ready right now. What, and how would it happen that we would lose the <laughs> You would lose it. That's, that's certain. Why? I mean, it will be confiscated. It will be returned to you after security went all through it yeah. and see that there are no shots of Falasha. Yeah. And you think that someone would find out if we've gone to... It's certain. It's certain. That I don't doubt. I'm sure, you know, you must realize, you know, this is all... We're only uh, two kilometers from Devak. 
And it, I, I bet you they already know we are here. I, no, listen, I'm not trying to, to stop you from going. I'm yeah. not to frighten you, but you must be ready to take the, what's, you know, what is. The consequences. The consequences. <laughs> and anybody who can take the consequences is free to, you know, even break laws and go do whatever. <laughs> but you have to be cool when it comes to consequences. Yeah. Yeah. We tried a different route. We realized that Palasha children living in this region would be attending state schools. We stopped at one such school and spoke to the teacher. Christianity. Christians, they are following the religion of Christianity. But there are some that are not Christians. Yes, there are rare of the students are not following. Yes, some rare students are Jews. They are following the religion of Jews. How many Jews would there be among this, uh, this school? About in this school, are, there are some you know, seven or ten Jewish students. Uh, and where do they live? Hmm? Jewish, where do the Jewish people live? They are living around. The Jews the are living all around this community. Do they live in separate villages, or are they all together? They are separate. No, separate. They are not separated. They are mixed socially and politically with the people. The teacher pointed out this young Jewish girl who was now wearing a cross. Marxist-Leninist texts, revolutionary doctrine, and military training all form part of the curriculum. You saw some of the students over in the field, they were marching? Yes, they can. They can march in military working like the Russian or the Cubans away from marching. Before going to Ethiopia, we studied maps of the Semin Mountains and consulted with Falashas living in the west. As a result, we knew the location of some remote Falasha villages, unfamiliar even to the guide. Pack horses loaded with camera gear, we began a 10-hour trek toward one isolated Falasha village. We were now joined by an army officer who boasted that he had killed eight student rebels. In the hours to come, the guide who was lured unwittingly into a Falasha village would try to get out of his predicament by intimidating the villagers and mistranslating whenever the Falashas became too controversial. There it was. Fearful of the government officials, the Falashas would answer evasively at first even denying having heard of Israel. Often a gesture revealed more than the spoken word. Everyone was nervous as the interviews were conducted in a village that officially should never have been entered. The House of Israel. Are they still able to carry on their religion here in this village? Do they carry on the... Yes, around here, there are many of us. Our religion is different. There are many of us. We believe in the Torah. Here comes the uh, rabbi. I'm our friend. Can he show us his uh, Bible? How long have they been living here in this village? A long time. How long do you think? Our fathers' fathers died here. Are they, are they happy living here? Do they enjoy living here? Is this not to death? Is this to Yes. Yes. After he created the world on the seventh day, God rested. 
Do you understand now? No, we are having a little discussion here about the uh, Old Testament, and he's, he was saying, uh, I was telling him that there are some people who go by the New Testament that don't have the same habits they do. And he and I was saying they have improved some, and he was saying that is not that's not good. And he he gave the uh, <clears throat> for example the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sacred commandment that it should be respected. And these people on the Sabbath do not do anything. They do not do. They don't walk. They don't work. Sabbath is resting. <laughs> Do they have much mean? contact with other uh, Jewish people in Ethiopia? I in Do you have contact with other Falashas in the area? What kind of contact? We do have religious gatherings. Yes, we do get together. Yes, we do have our reasons for getting together. We get together for special occasions. By the law of the Torah, we get together on Yom Kippur, Sig, Passover. On those special days, when we celebrate those holidays, our Kohan calls us together. Everyone comes together, congregates together, and we study the commandments, listen to the teachings, and do all the special things. Do they like it here? Do they want to go somewhere else? Huh? Do they know about Israel and all that? No, I'm not. You'd ask <laughs> Do you know of a country by the name of Israel? A foreign country? No, we have no way of knowing. We were born in Ethiopia, but we've heard rumors. We don't know if this place is in the country or outside. These days, when we listen to the radio and hear about what goes on outside the country, we hear Israel mentioned. But ourselves, we were born here, inside Ethiopia. I've heard of it by radio, and that they've been born, their forefathers have been born in Ethiopia, and they are Ethiopians, they know of Ethiopia. But now they've they hear by radio some things about Israel. But they're happy to be in Ethiopia. Are you happy to be living in Ethiopia? Even if you're not happy, you haven't got a choice. What can we do? These people think you have a connection with Israel. But you are Ethiopians, whether you like it or not. This is your country. Yes, yes, we are just simple people. We don't know about these things. Our fathers died here. We are already old. We will end our lives here, too. He says, you know, their, their forefathers' roots have been rooted here, and they have grown old here, and this is the country they know. Has it changed for them since the revolution? Has it got better for them here? Has it become better for you since the revolution? Sure, the new laws are good. For example, the law concerning land distribution and the laws concerning equal work opportunities. But the peasants' associations, which were set up to implement these new laws for the benefit of the poor, have not done so. And we are still suffering. We are suffering. The hunger, the many problems, the anguish is still on our shoulders. We still carry the burden. It's the peasants' associations which refuse to implement the new laws when it comes to us. Do you think you'll ever leave Ethiopia? Man does not follow the path of his own thoughts. It is the will of God that determines his destiny. The path God chooses for us, you can be sure will be the right one. It's extraordinary they've been able to keep this religion, this, which is rather... Our fathers, it comes down from our fathers. We are strong because of our religion. We don't want to break the commandments. We are prisoners of the Torah. <laughs> are they also doing the pottery and selling things to tourists like we see, uh, like we've heard about in other countries? Yes, the women and all of us work hard. We work hard, but they take it from us without paying. What do you mean without paying? You give it for free? Free? No, we work hard with all the effort we have and then others take it. They don't leave us anything. If they pay us, they pay us very little. To say that you work for nothing, that's not good to say. There's a peasants' association. If they hear about this, they will take some action. There is a peasants' association. There is a local governor working on these problems. Forget about the peasants' association. All they care about is themselves. You shouldn't say such things. They, they supply, they, they supply the, all the iron work, the iron tools. 
the pottery, you know, household goods, and weaving for, for the people around here. And that has been that has been that is now supported by a new hope, which is they 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 can harvest with uh, farming too. But that they still do that. Mm -hmm. While the guides were distracted at one end of the village, some of us had a few moments alone with the Falashas. Immediately, one young man took out an outlawed book from Israel and showed us that in the isolation of the Simeon Mountains, he has taught himself to read Hebrew. Also treasured was this Polaroid photograph of their Bible, the Torah, taken by a tourist in pre-revolutionary times. Ask him who it is, son. Mirze, Mirze. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Torah? Torah. Hello. Montreal, Canada. Baruch Tegeni runs a small diner here. He escaped his native village in Gondar after the revolution. Tegeni's odyssey to freedom in 1975 took him past Ethiopian patrols into the Sudan. He then fled to Chad. He walked for two days without water in the Sahara Desert. From Chad, he went to Cameroon and on to Nigeria, where he caught a plane to Rome and finally to Israel. When he tried to involve Israelis in the rescue of his people, he was told that rescue would be impossible. Frustrated, he came to Canada with his Canadian-born wife to raise support in America for the Falashas. With funds from the American Association for Ethiopian Jews, in 1979 he returned to Africa and smuggled 54 Falashas to freedom, thereby proving that rescue is possible. Do you think that the situation has changed at all since the revolution in villages like that? Nothing changed, is my, my opinion. Is, uh, first of all, the, when, the, when it started the revolution, so they also they decide to, uh, the Falasha, they never had uh, their own land. So this is the first time after the revolution, they start to give them land. But uh, still the people, they don't want them to own any piece of land, not less. So it doesn't matter that the, probably the law uh, is exist, but the landowner they never, never give a piece of land to them. And then there are few left, so uh, they cannot protect themselves by any, any kind of way. So they're just like a prisoner people. Start by telling me how Rejecting assimilation and believing that the Jewish community in Ethiopia faces its final crisis, thousands have fled into neighboring countries. This young Falasha woman, whose family still lives in Ethiopia, made it to freedom on her second attempt. <laughs> When I first thought of leaving for Israel, I didn't think I'd have problems along the way. I traveled a long distance over many roads. We were robbed by bandits along the way. Our legs were scratched and cut by thorns. We had blisters on our feet and we were hungry. It rained all the time. We came to a small village. Nearby, there was a big river. When we tried to cross it, we were caught. At first, they slapped us and kicked us. Then they put us in this place where they beat people. They have irons with screws that you can tighten, like this. After that, they put a stick between our legs with the point under our chin. Then they lifted our legs up until we were upside down. They tied our thumbs with leather, put them over our heads, and tied them back there. 
Then they started to beat us with a metal bar. We started to scream. That was the way they tortured us. They scared us by telling us they were going to kill us, so we never thought we would be released. The irons were so tight the blood could not circulate. Our hands and feet became swollen and some became paralyzed. Governor Malaku warned us repeatedly not to attempt to escape again. Then he said, you can go, but if you are caught trying to escape again, you will die. What is the government's policy in terms of immigration leaving Ethiopia? There is no general rule that prohibits individual Ethiopians to leave the country uh, as long as their uh, cases are legitimate. Uh, Ethiopians are permitted, there is no restriction uh, to leave the country if they wish to do so. Drought periodically sweeps Ethiopia. In the 1970s, famine ravaged many of Ethiopia's provinces. Hundreds of thousands died. This archival film was shot on the Ethiopia-Somalia border. The people who suffer most are the refugees who have fled war, tyranny, and poverty. In the spring of 1983, famine shifted from the Somali border to the provinces of Wallo, Tigre, and Gondar. In the belief that escape from Ethiopia would mean refuge in Israel, thousands of Falashas have become refugees in the Sudan. Most have not been rescued. To find out why and complete this crucial part of the inquiry, we journeyed to the Sudan. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees administers this camp near the Sudanese-Ethiopian border. The settlement is plagued by hunger-related diseases, dehydration, malaria, trachoma, and tuberculosis. There are 12,000 Ethiopians in this camp. 3,000 of them are Jews. When they arrive, the refugees are close to death. Many die en route. Those who make it are brought back to subsistence level by international relief agencies. Ironically, the Jews have fled persecution only to encounter even more of it here. Unwilling to be photographed, they disappear into huts. They are afraid to be identified as Jews. Age-old prejudices persist. Superstitious refugees believe that it is the Falasha's evil eye that causes suffering in the camp. Many have turned on the Jews. Caught between hostile neighbors, certain that Israel will soon save them, the Falashas wait. Their numbers diminish daily, a result of violence, hunger, and disease. Six hundred children die in that refugee camp. Women, children, don't have food. They don't have medical treatment. They try, you see, they try to reach to Jerusalem, and they didn't get it. Six hundred children. Who's talking about them? Who cares about them? Where the White Nile meets the Blue Nile, Khartoum, capital of the Sudan. A poor country chafing under the burden of hosting hundreds of thousands of refugees. We came here for two reasons. First, Israeli officials claim they cannot help Falashas because Israel has no diplomatic relations with this Arab country. Second, Jewish organizations in America say that the Sudanese put obstacles in the way of refugee aid. Sitting on the left, First Vice President of Sudan, Omer Mohammed Al Tayeb. And on the right, Ambassador to Washington, Duner Sabe Aisa. We asked them whether there was any truth to these allegations. 
No, there is no uh, grounds for this at all. On the contrary, we have been cooperating with all voluntary organizations in the United States and through the United Nations uh, in trying to facilitate the uh, departure of any refugees who found another homeland. Their springboard is the Sudan. Uh, some of them have uh, crossed the border to Israel. Some of them went to, to Rome. Some of them go to England. And we certainly would be happy to share with any friendly country uh, this burden. It is a burden on the Sudan. It's a burden on the, in our economy. And certainly would very much like to see voluntary repatriation of refugees, either to another land or to their country, if situations uh, make it possible. We hope the West will help in receiving some of these uh, refugees, uh, as the ambassador said before, and this is, will help them for their future. In the Sudan, uh, we are very flexible if they want to leave the country for any other country, especially the West, where they can find better life, uh, good future. Definitely, uh, we will help them, and there are no any obstacles uh, against that. Uh, the case of the Falashi Jews, where they wanted to be repatriated directly from uh, Ethiopia into Israel. We did not actually want it to, we didn't want to be party to that, but we welcome them as far as being refugees. If they cross the border into the Sudan, we welcome them as refugees. If from the Sudan they can arrange to go to wherever they want to, we'll be happy to facilitate that uh, to them in as much as uh, politically is feasible for us. But as a whole, if these uh, refugees cross the border in the Sudan, they'll have the same treatment humanitarian treatment that other people had. From then on, if they can make their own contact and be repatriated to another country uh, with which we have diplomatic relations, we welcome that. If they depart to another country with which we have relations and from then on go somewhere else, it's their business, we would not interfere. But somewhere else you mean Israel? Yeah, wherever I know they go to Israel. As a matter of fact, there are a number of, of Ethiopians that I met in the United States and their route was they crossed the border into the Sudan. From the Sudan, they went into Israel. I, not directly, of course, because there are no flights, but they probably have gone into some other country. From that country, they went into Israel, and from Israel into Rome, and from Rome into the United States. New York City, headquarters for the Jewish refugee aid organization, Hayas. The Sudanese say the Falashas can go. Leonard Seidemann argues that helping Falashas would compromise secret Israeli rescue operations. Are you saying there is no role for Hayas to play in the refugee situation? Of I would say Jews? the role we're playing in the political field is the role that we've, to which we've given the greatest priority. I'm asking, is there a role for Hayas to play in the refugee situation? We are playing that role. Well, what role is that? Staying out of Israel's way? No, no. That, that, that's not the way to put it. We are endorsing the fact that what they are doing is the correct approach. But what I'm trying to get to is not what you're endorsing, but what you're doing. We are, we are working in the political field. No, I'm talking about the refugees. Well, what, well uh, the political what? field is, is for the, on behalf of the refugees. What do you mean then by political field? Have governments try to get, try, have the United States government try to influence the policies of, of the governments involved, which make it difficult. Which government? To, the Sudan, for example. So you're trying to influence the Sudan government? As well as the Ethiopian government. Both we governments. spoke to the vice president of Sudan, and he said that, that uh, they are putting no obstacles in the way of any refugees uh, getting out, and he mentioned Falasha specifically. Well, that's the first time I ever heard that. I never heard that, and I would be glad to try to take it up with, to pursue that. That's an interesting piece of information you're supplying to me, and if I take the details of that, I would try to pursue it. But surely, if you're already involved in diplomatic and political efforts, you would have already approached the same people we interviewed. Our approaches did not produce the answer that you just told me you received. You spoke to the vice president of Sudan? No. No, no. You spoke to any, which Sudanese officials did you speak to? I was in Khartoum myself for several weeks, and I spoke locally. To? I can't mention their names. The camps are open. Everyday refugees depart for new lives elsewhere. Yet no one sponsors the Falashas. The principal reason given for not helping Falashas 
is that everything is being done to save them by undercover means. In an unprecedented interview, two Mossad, or Israeli Secret Service operatives, say this is not true. I was an operative for 10 months. During those 10 months, we rescued 1,600 people. Yes, I worked together with him. Before that, I was also active. For how long? I was an operative approximately five months. I'm told that everything possible is being done. Do you believe this? How can we believe it? Why? There are only a few people there. Do you understand? Because there are only a few people, they have to share the work. So two or three people do work hard. But if there were more people working on this, it would be possible to take those people out. During the period I was there, it was possible to save a lot of people, even in a single day. Yes, there was danger, but even with danger, one can also, one can also work hard and save many people. Have you made any efforts to reach those camps, identify and save some Jews? Well, I explained earlier that there are efforts which are going on which we endorse, and so we don't get in their way. That, how do you think the ones who have reached Israel already ever got there? Have you brought them to Israel? No, it was not our operation, but it's an operation which we endorse. But during the years that you said that nothing, nobody was getting out, what were they, what was highest doing? We would, we were... Uh, I don't, I can't, I'm not able to answer that. Hello. Yes. Nate Shapiro is president of the American Association for Ethiopian Jews. Okay. Right. From his home in Chicago, he has initiated several attempts to rescue Falashas. Has your organization saved people? We have been responsible for bringing close to 150 people out in one way or another to freedom. The response by the government of Israel has always been to bring out many, many more very quickly. And we hope they continue to. Uh, at which point, the American Jewish community says, well, you brought out 10, they brought out 100. You brought out 50, that brought out 500. But of course, that isn't the issue. The issue is that we're a, a ragtag group of amateurs who shouldn't be able to bring out anybody if it's as difficult as they say. In the Sudan, we were filming outside the camp when a young Falasha tentatively approached us. He was afraid of being identified as a Jew by hostile refugees and unwilling to lose this opportunity of sending a message to the world generally and to his uncle in Israel specifically. Later, he came back and spoke to us. Do you think he'll ever go back to Ethiopia? <laughs> Never. I'm not going back, because it's not just me, even our brothers inside Ethiopia. I wish they could get out. They are sitting on a fire. This non-Jewish former guerrilla of the anti-Mengistu Ethiopian Democratic Union corroborates these sentiments. The Falashas live a miserable life. On the face of this earth, I do not believe there is anyone who leads a more wretched life than they. They flee Ethiopia because they are labeled evil eyes and branded as sorcerers. They are landless and ostracized. Worse still, they come here to the Sudan, leaving their way of life behind them in the hope of finding freedom and safety. Instead, they have fallen into the hands of people who consider them enemies simply by virtue of their name. They are considered less than humans, dogs. If they feel like it, the locals kill them. Once near the border, they murdered 15 Jews and buried them in a mass grave. It's enough to make you cry. People of Israel, if you have compassion, you will save them. 
If you cannot, tell the world to save them. The way these people are living is shameful. And the shame is on you too, because they suffer in the name of Israel. They are tortured and degraded in your name. And your failure to show concern is a disgrace. It is in the name of Israel that these people die. I feel ashamed for you. The young Falasha refugee requested that we film him singing a song he had composed, a cryptic poem about his yearning to see the skies over Jerusalem to see the surviving Falashas brought to Israel before they all die. We located Babu Yaakov, uncle of the young Falasha refugee, outside Jerusalem at the home of Rabbi Adani, the first Ethiopian rabbi ordained in Israel. Since his nephew fled to the Sudan, Babu did not know whether the boy was alive or dead. He said, remember us, don't forget us. We are in uh, their, their place where they live. And the situation is very hard, very hard. As he said, like a, how do you say that? Corn. Like in a corn. corn in the fire. I was afraid to his family there when he escaped. Because there, the, if a guy, if an, anyone from the Jewish people escaped to, to another place, all his family was punished. I think. It is a message, just in another way. Okay. Ask about, about his situation. He just explained about his situation. And the situation and of all the Jews. Yeah. What is he expect for, uh, for Israel to do? He just say. We are in, uh, we are very difficult here. We are, uh, we're just going to die. After the song, the family listened to a personal message sent by the young Falasa refugee. Save us, save us, how we suffer. We find people with cut off hands, cut off legs, cut off heads. We don't even know who killed them. We couldn't piece together a single body for proper burial. Our history is drenched with blood. Save us. We want to fulfill our common destiny with Israel. Don't forget us. I just sometimes I couldn't understand it, why we should suffer. I mean, what we done, 
We are innocent people. We are not criminal. We just a black and Jew who like to preserve which we were keeping this religion. I don't know for how long in Ethiopia, more than 2,000 years. Just that we try to, uh, to give our life for that specific because we, we felt we are not guilty. Israel's parliament, the Knesset. The Falasha controversy is growing. We tried to get specific answers. Why were negotiations with Ethiopia impossible? Why have international relief agencies not been asked to save Falasha refugees? Why do Mossad operatives not receive proper logistical support? The prime minister and senior officials declined comment. Former prime minister Itzhak Rabin, seen on the left, defends past and present policies. Well, I believe that, uh, that these, all Israeli governments, through all the years, have tried to do their utmost to help Jews in distress in the countries when, well, they were not allowed either to maintain free Jewish life or there was no right to emigrate from that countries uh, to Israel. They didn't lift a little finger. And as a matter of fact, it's my... Dr. Grenenberger is founder of the American Association for Ethiopian Jews. Somewhere ...that their embassy, the Israeli embassy in Ethiopia, was even forbidden by an order to allow any of them to come. Why they should be against even the American Association, they try to save some of them to take them out. They say, no, we will do it, leave it to us. We know how to save Jewish life to all over the world. It doesn't work for Falasha at this point. The kind of efforts which are made are considerable, and since they include risks to the Falashians and to those who are involved, I would not uh, say more about it. Attorney Julius Berman is chairman of the President's Conference of Major American Jewish Organizations. For many, he is the spokesman for the American Jewish community. The President's Conference has followed Rabin's line and has not used its leverage in America or Israel to influence the rescue of the Falashas. Reports, and of course, when I was in Israel, I had uh, conversations on the subject. Conversations with who? Conversations with uh, basically um, Israeli officials, primarily uh, within the Jewish agency. Have you discussed this with the Prime Minister? No. Have efforts been made to try to exert leverage on the Ethiopian government to uh, allow the Jews more freedom inside Ethiopia? Uh, efforts have not been made uh, formally by the American Jewish community. I believe, in my firm opinion, that that would be useless and it would probably have a very negative effect. So it hasn't been on the President's Conference agenda? If you, if when you say the President's Conference, if you mean the President's Conference as opposed to its constituent organizations, yes. I mean that. Uh, it has not been in terms of our relationships, for example, with the American government on a day-to-day -day basis. The answer is yes. With respect to the Israeli government... Yes, what? Yes, we don't deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis with, with respect to the Falasha Jews. In fact, the NJCRAC, the constituent member of Julius Berman's organization mandated to handle the problem, deals with Congress on an ongoing basis. It has urged Congress not to get involved. The NJCRAC has told the American Jewish community to keep quiet about the Falashas, lest sensitive information fall into the wrong hands. Yet, in a confidential letter circulated on Capitol Hill and sent to numerous congressmen, dated June 29, 1983, the NJCRAC has divulged those allegedly sensitive details concerning Israeli rescue efforts. Precise data concerning the numbers of Falashas rescued from January to June 1983 are provided, including the dates of rescue. The NJCRAC gives congressmen the option of further circulating this information while instructing them to keep the media and the Jewish public in the dark. Quote, you may also want to share the essence of the letter 
with leadership through internal correspondence. However, we ask that none of the statistics be published in the general media nor in Jewish periodicals. The letter is signed by Robert Schreier, Chairman of the National Jewish Community Relations Advisory Council, Committee on Ethiopian Jews. When approached, the director, the chairman, and officers of the NJCRAC committee refused to comment on this issue. When people come here from Israel and tell us to keep our voices quiet, when the material is censored in Israel itself, and has been until this very day, how can anyone get active? When, if you speak out on their behalf, you're labeled a kook and the blood will be on your hands, how can any possible effort be made to form an organization to help people when help is equated with quiet? And in reality, quiet, of course, is their death. Public statements about Falasha Jews may be of detriment to Falasha Jews. The Ethiopian Jews have lived and died in silence for a very long time. That's no longer possible and it's not necessary. Frustrated with their leadership, no longer willing to believe that silence is the best way to help Ethiopian Jews, in Jerusalem,